as soon as you see the red clock, you may start. Sure, thanks. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to session two of our grant writing sessions, um, session two of session three. Today, as I said, we're going to be looking at the steps or different parts of writing a grant proposal. Um, OK, I'm going to do that and then start with the presentation. All right, so in session one, we were looking at the broad overview of what grant writing is all about what is required in terms of the criteria what you need to look out for and some of the important points that you need to be aware of and keep in mind if you are interested in applying for a grant so today we're going to look at the actual grant itself or grant proposal so what is it that is involved in grant writing how do you structure it? What are the various elements of the of the grant itself? OK, so what we have here is the different steps of grant proposal writing. So this is just an overview. Um, you're interested in putting together a proposal that when you submit to the funder, has got a high chance of being funded. OK, so what are some of the elements then of the proposal? First, you need to have a title and you really need to think seriously about how you put together your title, right? The descriptive title. And then you need to think about uh, the summary of the abstract or the abstract that you're going to provide, which is going to give again um, a snapshot of the project that you're going to be writing about. And here you need to think carefully about what you put on your abstract because some funders use this abstract uh, at the end to then be able to speak about your work or when they do a summary of all the proposals that they are funding, they use these abstracts to then be able to speak and to be able to put on their website about the work that they are funding. And often with this abstract, again, you want to avoid a lot of jargon. And just like with journal publications, your abstract needs to be very clear, straightforward, try and avoid using jargon here as well. OK, and then the heart or main part of your proposal is the project description or the narrative. So this is where you are explaining to us what is the project about? Why is it important for us to give time and money to this project? Right, so here you have to convince the reader about the importance of this project that you're doing. So you provide a narrative indicating and highlighting the background, what the problem is, what the issue is, and what your aim is, how you're entering this conversation, and how you're going to go about doing the actual work. Okay, so that's the project description. Again, be as clear as possible. This is where the majority of the proposal is going to be focusing on, on project description. And then, as I said, or again, also on Monday, the budget is very, very important. So what you've said in the project description has to lead you to the budget that you're going to be putting together. So what funds do you need to be able to do this project? What funds do you need to be able to carry out some of the, not even some, but all of the things that you've described in your project description? So it has to be very clear and, and one uh, has to see all the connections in terms of 
understanding that this and that and that budget item are in line with this and that and that activity as indicated in the project description. OK, and then the management plan. So here we're talking, for example, about things like the timeline, right? So the timeline of your work. So if you need funding for three years or if you need funding for five years, what is it that's going to be happening in those five years? What's going to happen in the first six months? What's going to happen in the following six months? What's going to be happening three months down the line? So again here, it's going to go back to the project description, but it also goes to the budget as well. So if you need um, a certain amount of money, you need to be able to then know whether that money is going to cover those three years that your project is going to be running. And then, of course, the dissemination and evaluation. What's going to happen after you've done the work? How are you going to put the work out there? What is it that we can expect based on this work that you've done? OK, so this is just in a nutshell, uh, the steps of the grant proposal. And here, obviously, in terms of what the content is about, um, we, will, we will discuss that um, in a bit. Uh, again, um, in snapshot, uh, but with a bit of detail, thinking about what needs to be in each part of or each section of your proposal. Um, I said the title, the title proposal or proposal title is the label. Right, so if you think about a product that you want to sell, a product that you want to advertise, that you want to put out there. Um, so what label do you give it and what is the meaning of that label? Right, so it should not be a sentence, but it should be um, a description of what the work is about. So it's a label, what is this work about? So if you already have an idea and it's very clear in your head, you can become very creative in terms of coming up with uh, a title that's going to capture the core of the work that you're going to be doing, right? It must be very accurate and succinct. So it should not be a sentence or a long sentence, three, three lines long, but it's just a title, right? Because again, um, it's about the impression that you're going to give to reviewers. Again, when the proposal is put out there, it's, it's either blind reviewed or if it's not blind reviewed, then it's your name. It's the title of the proposal before we even get to any other part of the proposal. So what is your title saying to me as the reviewer immediately? OK, and then the project description. When you're thinking about the project description, you need to think about all the different aspects that are going to be in this description or narrative. Generally, and this may differ again, depending on who the funder is and how much information they want, what the call is saying. So you're going to be led by the call that you're going to send your proposal to. But generally, um, proposals tend to be about 15 pages. So how are these 15 pages then divided? Because this is inclusive of all the different parts. OK. The actual research plan itself. Is about six to 10 pages. Right, um, so two thirds of the whole proposal. So this is where you're going to be giving all the background, uh, describing what the issue is, the aim of what you want to do, um, and then drawing from literature as well, showing that you are actually aware of what already exists. You are aware of what others have said. Um, and as, as, as you're writing also, it's going to be two to three pages of the whole 10 pages, right? The funding agency wants to know what is it that you're going to be doing as the researcher with the money if the grant is awarded. So what are the specific things that you're going to be doing? OK, so the introduction or the significance and objectives of your project. So the half a page where you you quickly just um, introduce the work and then speak about it's important for us to do this because by doing this we'll be able to do one, two and three, right? So you'll see it's about half to one page. 
So your introduction is not going to go on and on and on. When we, you give us a lot of background, which will take up space and not give you enough time to actually focus on the core, because what we want to do is we want to get an understanding of what you as the researcher are going to be doing, right? So all of that then um, means you're not going to spend a lot of time focusing just on the introduction, right? So your introduction should be clear. Um, it's an overall statement of what will be done in the, pro in the proposed effort. Um, do not dance around the issue. So say what it is that the work is going to be doing. So don't explain something in three sentences that you can explain in one sentence, right? Be straightforward, use straightforward language uh, and explain what exactly is it that you are planning. If it's clear in your head what it is that you're planning to do and all the different ways in which you would, you, you would like to do things, then it becomes easier to be straightforward because you know exactly what you want to do, then you state that which you want to do. Because if it's not straightforward and you are dancing around on the issue, that may appear to the reviewer as if you're not really sure and that your plan is not well thought out. Okay. Um, if there are terms to be defined, you define the terms there as well. Um, your goals should be very clear. What are the objectives? What is it that you're hoping to, to reach? Okay. And then the management, um, half a page to two pages. It's the, it's the most important part um, where you also speak to the timeline of all the project years and activities. Um, as I've just said in the previous slide, what is it that you're going to do in the first month, in the first three months, in the first six months? So for each and every aspect, part of the project, you explain what is it that's going to be happening. So again, depending on whether this is going to be over a period of two years or three years or five years, that will determine whether this, uh, this part will be half a page or a page or two pages. So again, making sure that you explain as much as possible so that it's clear that you have thought about all the different phases and stages of your project, but also it's going to assist you also when you're thinking about the budgeting as well. Okay. All right, and then just continuing with the snapshot again, um, the evaluation or how the assessment is going to take place. So what's going to happen at the end? How do we know whether this was a success? What is it that you're going to do with the findings? What is it that you're going to do with the outcome? What is it that you're going to do with the product at the end that you would have uh, developed? So one of the things that one would expect uh, within academic spaces um, is a publication. So whether you've submitted a paper, it's been accepted for publication, or maybe there's a paper that's already been published. So for example, if you're doing a five-year project or a three-year project, uh, one would expect that along the way, as you get your results, um, that you would already start thinking about putting work together that you submit for publication. That you're not going to wait for the end of the five years before you think about publication, right? So the evaluation is ongoing, um, but there's also the evaluation at the end as well, right? So we're talking formative um, and summative evaluation. And then dissemination again, uh, leading from the, the previous one, um, is the distribution of the research results. Is it going to be within academia? Is it going to be to the broader community? Is it going to be with the relevant stakeholders who are working, organizations maybe working uh, with the focus area that your work was, was, was engaging with, but also then sharing with colleagues um, at conferences as well um, as part of dissemination, but also getting feedback as well from colleagues who are in, in the in the same field as you. OK, so what other avenues are there? Um, we're living in a time where we must we must think also beyond just publications, publications specifically in academic journals. What are other ways in which work can be disseminated? Right, so um, through online platforms as well, where anyone can access the work. 
is also another option in which work can happen. But also, how can your work lead to the rethinking maybe of your discipline, the rethinking of the particular field that you're working in? Um, and here we're talking about possible recurriculation or short courses. So if you come up with ways in which we can rethink um, medicine for particular ailments, and maybe you did work that has looked at some specific indigenous um, medicines, maybe as part of what you found out, what you tested, um, what you then came up with, that which you've come up with can also now be included in the teaching um, of, of, of medicine, right? And in the teaching of understanding of medicine and the role that indigenous uh, traditional medicine can also uh, come into the ways in which we think about medicine, uh, but also how we use medicine or introducing different forms or new forms of medicine that may be may not necessarily be new, but have not been um, in the mainstream, have not been used. Um, I know, for example, we learned about some of the traditional uh, herbal medicines that uh, have always been under our noses that we never thought about or taken seriously until uh, COVID happened. Um, and I think in many ways it really helped uh, people who would otherwise not have access to other forms of um, medicine. Okay. Um, and then the budget. The budget is also very important. Some reviewers begin their review with the budget because the budget tells a story. For some people, it might just look like it's putting together the numbers linked to the activities that you're doing, but actually there's a lot that one can glean from uh, looking at the budget and things that you choose to budget for. So when reviewers go for the budget, they do this because they understand that through looking at the budget, they can see what the researcher really plans to do. Budget requests usually in, include faculty or teaching and student salary support. Okay, so already you're thinking, OK, there's going to be students that are going to be part of the study. In what way? Um, a student assistant, may perhaps, so you might have some of the masters and doctoral students as part of your as part of your project, so they need to be paid. So the salary for that as well. Maybe for faculty, even if you're working with collaborators, you might need to buy time out for, for people because when they're focusing on the research, then they can't focus on the teaching. So they, they'll be busy with this research project. And so you need money so that someone can step in, maybe a contract person to take over the teaching during the lifespan of the project, right? So travel to conferences, uh, field sampling sites, research supplies that you're going to require, course development, for example. So the putting together, the printing, the editing, all of that. If these things are in your budget, but in your description and planning of the project, they are not included, then obviously you can see that uh, there's a discrepancy and it may say to the reviewer, this project has not been well thought out, right? So you're asking money for cost development, but under your evaluation, uh, when you in, in the narrative of your proposal, you didn't say anything about one of the outputs being cost development. So why do you need money for cost development if you didn't say that one of the things that you would like to do is cost development, right? Or vice versa. So making assumptions. So you're saying this 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 work and the outputs will lead to cost development where we rethink um, medicinal teaching or teaching about various forms of medicine. But then in the budget, you don't say anything about that cost development. Where is the money for that process going to come from? So you see how the, the interconnectedness works. OK, and also sometimes you, you may over budget or under budget, right? So if there's no or very little money requested to support a particular activity that, as I've said, you might have mentioned in your plan, 
that does not require money to occur. It may indicate to reviewers that the proposer, um, you, the applicant, has not done sufficient preparation to actually do this activity. Right, so sometimes it comes across as if something was an afterthought. It comes out as if you are saying this is what you're going to do because that's what you think is expected of you um, when putting together a, a proposal that you may mention all these things that are going to be um, outcomes, but the activities in terms of the budgeting um, do not indicate that. So you have to make sure that there is this correlation between all the different aspects. So what is it that separates a successful research grant proposal from a failing submission? I think some of the things were implied in what I've already said thus far. Uh, but we're going to look uh, specifically at some of these aspects. So here we're going to look at what we call the good and the bad um, of grant proposals. OK, so the good in this case would be that you've clearly conceptualized your problem. It's very clear to me as the reader what the problem is, what the issue is. Right. So it's very clear. The focus area is very clearly defined as I read your proposal. It comes out without me having to look for it. OK, and then accurate alignment between the problem that you've identified and the terms of reference of the proposal call. So the call that came out for funding, inviting you and other people to apply for funding has stipulated what is it that is required? What is it that the funder is willing to fund? So in your proposal, in how you've put it together, it's very clear that there is an alignment between your problem and what the call is asking for. OK, and then of course, um, within uh, academic spaces, things have to be scientifically justified, right? Um, the focus area has to be scientifically justified, so it has to be well evidence problem uh, justification. Why is this a problem? Have others looked at this? What did they find? Has maybe nobody ever looked at this and why is it therefore a need for us to look at it. And you it's not something that you can just decide, wake up and, and think and decide that, no, I want to focus on this. I want to do research on that. Um, it has to be scientifically justified. And you'll see here, this is very much in line with what you're already doing with your own master's or doctoral studies, that as you're putting together your proposal or as you're busy working already on your on your doctoral thesis or uh, master's dissertation, you know that every aspect of the work that you're doing has to be uh, justified and not just justified, but scientifically justified, right? Um, is it in line with what others have said? Is it theoretically grounded? Um, is it based on research that has been done? So evidence based, for example, uh, what is it? What what are the sources that you've used? Right? Um, is it is it knowledges that are embedded in communities, um, historical embodied knowledges? How do we deal with that? How do we engage that? So that also becomes pro uh, very important for you to then be able to justify the work that you're doing. If that is clear in your proposal, then you are on the right track. All right, um, clear, researchable and aligned aim and objectives. Theoretical and empirical. If all of those are clear and, and, and straightforward, then your proposal is good. And then, of course, social imperative, uh, topicality and relevance. What is the relevance of the problem that you're focusing on? We all have things that fascinate us. We all have things that interest us, but are those things relevant? What are the pertinent issues that are facing us as a society, as the world? So depending on your context where you are based, what are the relevant issues that are at the moment at the forefront of what the society is dealing with? 
So topicality as well, just meaning, you know, is it um, a current topic? Is it uh, something that is part of the priorities that we're thinking about? Um, is it a social imperative, as we often call them, right? And then the rationale for why this has to be done or the rationale for why it has to be done in this particular way. Is that clear, right? So the justification again of the research plan, why it's going to be done this way, what is it that you're hoping to achieve? Okay, and then of course, putting things together, making sure that the narrative flows, the golden thread, things that combine um, one point or one section to another. So the project proposal aspects, all the different aspects have to be interconnected. You saw that the snapshot that I showed at the beginning, each one has to lead to the next. As much as, for example, in your own work that you're doing right now, same as that. So here, but we, we're doing it slightly different because you are speaking to a particular audience, which is the funder, which is the reviewer. So, and and it's called the competition in, in other platforms when you are applying for grant proposal because it is a competition, right? When you're writing a thesis or a dissertation, you're, you're not in competition. But here is a competition in that you are coming up with a proposal that you're submitting and hoping that someone is going to give you funding to do this work. And while you are applying, there's 100 other people who are also applying for the same funding that you're applying for. So that's why it's very important um, for you to write and ensure that your proposal stands out in some ways, but to also write your proposal in, in a way that does not leave any questions and therefore making sure that your, your, your chances of success are high. Okay. Is this study feasible? I'm sure you've heard this um, or you've had this conversation with your supervisors, the feasibility of the study. Again, we might have ideas, we might want to do work, but when you actually start thinking about the practicality, whether you're going to be able to do the study, what are the, the possible challenges that might lead to the study not being possible? Um, and you not being able to see to the end. So have you considered and thought about the feasibility? That's also important. And if it comes across, right, that as I read, as a review, I can see how you know, that this study is feasible. Sometimes you read a proposal and you realize that this is not feasible based on one, two, three reasons. Right, so it, 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 you have to do a study that is feasible. Um, demonstrable practice, theory and skills, capacity extension. So what is it that's going to happen as a result of this study? The students that you're going to supervise or support. So extending in terms of capacity, um, people that you're going to uh, involve in your project as well. Um, practice in terms of how this is going to contribute towards uh, practice within that discipline. So it's also very important. And of course, a good proposal will have a very good budget, right? Which um, has all the different items very rational and showing how each and every aspect of the project is going to be carried out and how much each and every aspect of the project is going to to cost. OK. All right. So what are some of the bad then? Um, a bad proposal is that there is loose problem focus based exclusively on anecdotal rather than broad based empirical evidence. If you're going to say um, there are so many women dying. A lot of women are dying. And so I want to do research to engage with this issue of women dying or um, that to reduce the, the number of women that are dying. And then you don't go on to 
justify or to support that claim that you're making, right? Um, you can say it's just because it's in the news every day we're getting these reports in the news, right? Um, many people have in conversations have noted how this is happening, right? So that's anecdotal. Um, if you're going to make a claim, you need to then be able to justify that claim, right? So that you can be able at the end to have a, a statement, a thesis statement that says, you know, as a result of this, we have to give attention to this issue. As a result of this, I think we have to look at this as a problem. And because it is a problem, we need to devise means and ways to come up with solutions to this problem, right? But if that's not clear, then your proposal as chances of success are very low. And then poor or no alignment between the problem and the reference um, of the proposal call. Again here, if what you are proposing is not in line with what the funding is about, then of course you're not going to get that funding. And then non-researchable and poor alignment of the aims and objectives. So how are you putting your, are you coming up with your aims? What objectives are you trying to reach? Um, and are they the kind of objectives that uh, are reachable? Sometimes, and, and I think we have to understand the difference as well about being realistic and, and want, wanting to end world hunger. I think all of us would like to see world hunger ending. Um, and if you don't want to see that, then I will be rather worried about you. Um, but you, you, you cannot, um, come up in, in, in with with objectives that my my objective is that with this study um i would like to see world hunger ending that's your study that's your that's that's the objective that you want to reach so what kind of research are you going to undertake then to be able to reach this objective of ending world hunger hmm. Okay, so that's a bad, uh, that's a bad objective and, and that, that, that would not assist you um, to, to get a grant. Okay, and then while we all have personal interests, we have things that we are passionate about and sometimes we do get lucky that we might be able to connect interests with or our interests are somehow aligned to the imperatives, um, do not force that, right? So we, you might have your own personal interests, but look at what the call is about, look at what the funding is interested in, and don't try to force your own interest on what the funding is about. So look at the, social imperative and the relevance and think about how all of that are in line with the proposal and also in line with the focus that you want to have for the research. Um, and so the personal interest should not be put at the center because that can uh, create a, a challenge. All right, and then um, wasteful research plan, right? So if you have a research plan, um, but the research plan is not indicating or showing what is it that the work is going to achieve, that's not going to be helpful for us, right? So um, if your work is non-pasmonious, you don't want that. And then failure to demonstrate clear incremental golden thread between key project proposal aspects. I've already spoken to that and the issue of feasibility as well, of course. And then it's not clear uh, how your study is going to um, demonstrate practice, how we can then take this into practice or theory building um, or even skills as well. What is, it, what is it that is going to lead to? What is it that students, postgraduate students, are going to gain if they're part of your project. 
And then if the budget is, is very poor, again, obviously, as I've already indicated, that is going to lead to you not getting the funding. So what are some of the common mistakes that many people who apply for funding uh, end up doing? Significance. Okay, so the study is not deemed as significant or exciting or new research. Right, so new research does not necessarily mean doing something that no one has ever done, has ever thought about. It could be building on something that, that someone has already done. There are many ways um, and many programs and many projects that people have done um, thinking about water purification. If you were to, to to read and look at some of the experiments and research that colleagues um, have been doing, you, you'll see and actually realize there's so much research that's been done. I was privy to part of the research that um, some master's students and PhD students were doing um, in our college, um, CSET focusing on nanotechnology, right? Um, and just a group of students working on a project, but coming at this project from multiple perspectives and from multiple contexts in thinking about the different places where we can think about water purification uh, from our own households, in the urban areas, in the cities, to our homes, in the rural areas, um, depending on how people get access to water, and also thinking about the water purification programs. So the research is very significant, right? Um, and it is exciting because when you're thinking about water, it's something that is very pertinent, that is very important, that none of us can say does not affect us. Right. Um, and it becomes new depending on the approach. Right. So when you're thinking about how makeup affects water. Right. So when you go and you wash your face and you wash uh, the makeup off or when you've got your makeup on and you go into the water, whether it's swimming pool or the ocean, what that does. All right. So all these interesting ways or in interesting views in terms of how we think about a particular phenomena, like the many ways in which we can think about water, how it gets polluted, how we can think about its purification, that there can actually be 20 research projects looking at water purification, but coming at it from very different perspectives, contextually, uh, background, so you can even come at it from a social science perspective. You can come at it from a pure science perspective. You can come at it from even an economic perspective or even from a legal perspective. So it's 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 how you you frame your work, how you're coming into the questions that you are asking that can assist in us seeing your work as fitting into what we can call new research, right? So when you're thinking about water purification and the law, how can we look at, at that and, and, and think about doing research focusing on that? Okay, so that, that is, that is um, significance. And if that is not clear in your work, um, then, that becomes that that becomes a challenge, right? So significance. Why is it significant? Right. Again, with the context, it's significant because some rivers or some community uh, rivers have become privatized, so that we can now buy water. Right. So we buy water, and there are corporations that get rich as a result of people buying water while at the same time there's actually um, social impact of that because there are communities that don't have access to clean water while they have rivers close to them 
that somehow those rivers are privatized. Right? So the legal implication, the social implication of that, right? So there are different ways in which one can look at this. And, and obviously that's significant because of the implications that they that it has on people's lives. But if that's not clear in your proposal, then obviously um, your proposal won't be considered. Uh, lack of compelling rationale. Um, if there is no proper rationale for the work that you're doing, then obviously you won't be funded. All right. So why is it important for us to think about communities that don't have access to clean water? What is the rationale behind that? It might appear obvious, but you need to explain so that it's clear how we can put the dots together and how doing this work is going to assist us to be able to deal with that challenge. That has got multiple implications if you think about it. Okay, and then uh, low demonstra demonstrable impact of research. How is your, your research going to be impactful to the community? Um, issue of water and water purification, very important, goes without saying. However, you need to be able to pro to, to demonstrate um, what kind of impact in what way, leading to you then saying as a result of this, it's important for us to give attention to this. Okay. Your aims should not be too ambitious. OK, do not promise too many things. Right, so don't uh, promise too much work. Don't propose too much work. Uh, because at the end, the funder has got expectations. If you promise seven things and you only provide four at the end, then we cannot say your project was successful. So don't promise too much. Right, um, and focused aims and clear goals. Obviously, that means you are not clear about what it is that you want to do. And if you're not clear about what it is that you want to do, no one is going to take a risk on what you're doing. If your aims are not clear, your goals are not clear, not focused, even in your own research proposal as a graduate student, you know your proposal will not pass if your aims are not clear, right? We always say this, um, your aims and objectives are very important because it is from those that you go all the way. They're going to lead you to saying, this is how I'm going to do my research. I'm going to do a quantitative or a qualitative study because doing it this way, talking to people or, or putting together a survey will assist me to get one, two, and three. And if I get one, two, and three, then I would have achieved my aim. Again, one thing leading to another. If your aims, your goals, your objectives are not clear, then I'm already worried about your methodology. All right. Limited aims and uncertain future directions. Again, when you're doing your study, if you're already busy with your thesis, at the end, your last chapter, we want to see where does this leave us? Your dissertation or thesis has got an end, right? You're going to write that conclusion chapter, but you need to say based on this, this is how we can look forward. All right, so the same again um, with writing a grant proposal. What are the future directions at the end when you're thinking about this? The, the, the dissemination and the evaluation and the conclusion are going to assist us to think about how we can go forward in ensuring that people have got access to clean and water. OK. All right. And then problems with experimental approach, inappropriate level of experimental detail, those who are doing experimental research. Again, it has to be very clear how you're going to do your experiments, uh, what's going to be needed, all the different steps that you're going to take. So what, again, when you're talking about the management plan, 
of your research, this has got to be very clear as well. Um, the experiments and follow up experiments and all that process and how that's going to go about. Um, feasibility of each aim is not shown. Again, that's a common mistake, little or no expertise with the approach and that can come across, right? So a, again, when you're thinking about the resources that you require, um, you cannot do a qualitative research and then um, outsource all the, 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 the analysis of, of the work that you're going to be doing because you need to be actively involved in that process and the same with quant as well that even if you may consult a statistical expert but you need to have an understanding of qualitative research and qualitative methodologies um, because if you don't then how will you be able to engage um, with the research that you've done how will you be able to engage with the results how will you be able to understand the interpretations um, of of what's significant and what's not and what does that mean right so lack of appropriate controls also if you're doing um, studies also where you're going to be doing your research and studies and experiments and then you've got your control um, what is the control group and, and actually the, 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 the research group how are you going to be able to make those uh, comparisons so as you're working on your description of the study and talking about the methodology all of this will, will, should be very clear so not directly testing your hypothesis uh, no discussion of alternative models or hypotheses as well um, if all of these are not discussed and clear then uh, it weakens your proposal. No discussion of potential pitfalls. What are some of the things that we need to think about? Uh, no discussion of interpretation of data. That this is what you're going to be doing. This, these are, these are the processes you're going to follow, and this is what you intend using uh, to make sense of your data, to analyze your data, and by doing so, that will assist you um, with then being able to make sense of the data that you that you have and how is that interpretation going to be done. OK, so but all these have to be very um, short and straight to the point. One, two, three sentences, depending on what it is that you're saying, because remember, again, you have 15 pages to discuss everything, all right, all the different aspects of your work. And then problems with the investigator, you. No demonstration of expertise or publications in approaches. OK, so if um, you are applying for a lot of funding, like two million, five million, the expectation is that you. Are already. A knower in that field, so you're not going to be doing uh, work that you have got no background in. Right, so you are applying for work because this is something that you've been contemplating on, that you've been thinking about, that you've been writing about, that you want to build on. Right, so do you have any any publications in this area? Have you worked with other people in this area? And if you have not, um, who are you involving? What is your role? What is their role? Right, especially if you're going to be the principal investigator, expectations are that you're going to be leading the project. And that therefore you have knowledge in terms of what the project is about. Low productivity, few recent papers, again linked to that. So are you an active researcher or not? So if you're going to write a proposal and you're promising the funder five articles, but if I check, and, and this is a funding that's going to be for the next three years. So for the next three years, you're going to get three million um, and you're going to be doing this research. And then in your application, in your proposal, you are, pr you are promising that you're going to be producing five articles as, as a result of this project. And then when I look at your CV, I look at the past three years to use it as a way to gauge what's possible, what you are capable of. And then I find that you, you did not publish anything in the past three years. But here you are in this proposal saying you're going to publish five papers in three years. I'm sure you can see the problem there. All right. 
problems with investigator and the environment, so inadequate institutional support. So if as a student you are applying for funding, let's say you are applying for funding to the NRF or other similar uh, funding body. When you're working on your grant proposal, you need to ensure that you've got support from your institution. Have you had a conversation with your supervisor? Have you had a conversation with whoever is relevant that whose support is going to be necessary for your application to be considered by the funder? And unfortunately, we are often surprised. It, it happened to me not so long ago, now this year, what how I came to know that my student has applied for funding, external funding, was me getting notification from the funder uh, asking me to well alerting me of the of the application, but also asking for my support for the application. Firstly, I never got to see the student's proposal. I'm not sure what it is that, that they said and what they were asking for, what they said they're doing. I uh, was not privy to that. Um, and so the only thing that I got to know or how I came to be aware was when I got that notification from the funder. Please don't do that. If you are intending to apply for funding, have a conversation with your supervisor about it. It can only be to your, your, your advantage. Yes, maybe the supervisor might say, no, I don't think the proposal is strong enough or I don't think you should apply, but then maybe based on these reasons, um, that's a conversation to be had, right? But what you, you stand to gain a lot. You stand to gain a lot because um, your supervisor can provide you with guidance. Your supervisor has been through that path before and they, they, they may have a better understanding of the processes and so might assist you then to be able to ensure that your proposal is ready and uh, good enough to be submitted, but also um, to alert the supervisor so that they are aware that you are intending to apply for this funding uh, and that you are going to include their name as a as a as a referral as someone uh, to support their application so that they're not surprised when it does come through okay so it can only be to it can only be to advantage um for you to make sure that you you inform you inform your your supervisor when you do apply all right so sometimes the supervisor might be away maybe on leaves i know some colleagues sometimes when they go on leave and the leave can be three weeks can be a month so depending on what kind of leave it could be research leave and when they go away some colleagues also don't check their emails during that time because it's time all for them to focus on their own work um, or time to rest. So what happens then if that email from the funder comes during that time, right? So when you have alerted me, so even if I'm away, I know that there's something that maybe I might expect because after the closing date, they usually send a, a few days later or just before the closing date. So that information is very helpful. So sometimes you may end up losing out on funding unnecessarily, all right? So make sure that you have that uh, adequate institutional support. And in your case, um, this would be your supervisor or, or the dean, depending on, on the kind of funding that you are applying for. Some funders actually do require that as part of your funding, you include your supervisor. Obviously, in that in 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 that case, then you can't re, you can't not include your supervisor and still apply and submit. And and often that then makes things easier and it becomes helpful. But others don't. And often then uh, students make that mistake of not notifying the supervisor. Please do. Okay, and then no collaborators recruited or no letters from collaborators. If in your application, in your proposal, you're intending 
interesting to work with other colleagues, either from the same university or from other universities. Make sure that you start having conversations with these colleagues while there's still time, right? And when you do apply, the letters of collaborations have to be in place. They strengthen the application. Sometimes they are a requirement, sometimes they're not a requirement. And if they are a requirement, you have to make sure that those letters are included. Okay, so the ground rules um, when writing a grant proposal, what do these mean, right? So we all have our philosophical assumptions, our standpoint in terms of how we come into the work that we do, how we come into the research that we do. Um, and so when you're applying for a grant proposal and when you're developing a grant uh, proposal um, within the academic space that we're in uh, for now, um, you also need to think about the conventions. What is it that is required? What is it that is acceptable, right? So even if the philosophical assumptions might be different in terms of how we approach research, how we come into research as critical scholars um, or as more um, positivistic scholars, for lack of a better word, research has some universal characteristics. Right. So if we think about how we go about conducting research, what is the purpose of research? What is uh, research within the academic context? Right. Um, that that stands. That's very important. So as you're putting together a grant proposal, you have to 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 be aware and be conscious um, of what is it that is required, that is needed from you. Right. So. Even if you have your own philosophical assumptions, research has to be systematic, right? So that's just how it is by nature, all right? And it, it's rigorous and it's about a disciplined search for the truth. So think about private investigators, think about uh, investigative journalists, uh, but they do a lot of research, very systematic research um, when they are looking into a particular issue or when they are looking into a particular perpetrator or, or criminal um, activity. So there's a systematic way in which this is done. So you cannot just go and arrest somebody. You cannot just go and say the there are people who are doing criminal activities and then you 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 arrest them, um, which is different from when the police arrest people. And then when you go to court, you have to um, provide justification as to whether this person is guilty or not. So the evidence that you require. Um, and so where does that evidence come from? So when you're in, in investigating, and this is why, again, in, in research, we speak about investigating. So you're investigating something as a researcher, right? Um, you want to explore, you want to investigate, you want to measure. So investigation also as a core. So it's it's also, very, again, very systematic. So the question is, what are you investigating? Why are you investigating? How are you going to go about with your investigation? How are you hoping to get to the end result and find what it is that you are looking for, right? How are you going to get to the truth? What processes, what steps are you going to follow to get to that truth, right? And truth here, uh, very, very broadly in terms of what we think about or, or see as the truth, but it's, it's rigorous. So you conduct research, you follow particular steps, you do your, your, the groundwork so that you can be able to get to the end result. And this is done in a disciplined manner. Okay, so again, understanding systematic is not synonymous necessarily the same with pre-planned, right? So you can plan pre-planned pre things, but it does not mean you're being systematic, but it relates to careful decision making, right? So this is my aim. 
this is my problem. This is my rationale. This is what I've checked and I see that others have done this and said this and done things this way. And based on this, I think this is the approach that I'm going to take. So this is the direction that I'm going to go. And I'm making this decision based on one, two and three. So I'm not making this decision because I like this particular one. I'm making this rationally because it makes sense for me to be able to get to the destination that I want. Right. And then you've weighed the choices. Right. Are you going to use thematic analysis, content analysis, discourse analysis? Why? Why is this relevant? How is this particular uh, form of analysis useful? for the kind of work that you're doing, right? So all of these are things that you think about as you're doing your research. These are all the things that you think about at all the different stages of your research. Should all of these, again, um, mean that as you're doing your work, these should be seen as a series of thoughtful decisions about alternative approaches and their consequences. What are the what are the steps? What are the models? What is the policy that we can take on to ensure that people do not get sick from drinking water that is contaminated? Right. So how is this work that I'm doing in looking at the importance of water purification? going to assist me to get to the end point? What are some of the consequences? Are there other possible ways or solutions or conclusions? Why am I getting to this? What is, how am I putting together my research in a way that assists me to be able to answer the question that I have, to engage the hypothesis that I come with? Okay, so parsimony, I spoke about this earlier. Um, and this is just an example again. So just as the largest library, we can have the largest library, right? If it's badly arranged, it's not going to be useful. Then if you have a moderate library, right that is well arranged so those who are in uh, library science or information science would know the importance of um, arrangements when it comes to um, libraries and how they're structured so think of yourself if you were to go to a library and our libraries were not organized as they are and you're looking for a particular book in a particular field or in a particular area if the library is not properly arranged, where are you going to start? Right? So the greatest amount of knowledge, this is what this speaks to. The greatest amount of knowledge, if not elaborated by our own thoughts, is worth much less than a far smaller volume that has been abundantly and repeatedly thought over. Right. There's an example that someone also uses that um, you can write a long, 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 long letter. But that letter can actually say absolutely nothing, even though the letter has got 10 pages. And you can write a letter that is just a paragraph or one page. And that letter can be so profound. Right. So it's not about writing and writing and writing or or the length of the work that you do but it's about the importance of being as clear as possible in the work that you're doing right it's not about creating the most amount of knowledge that you have written 10 books but what is the value of those books what are those books teaching us telling us contributing to how we see the world and see ourselves and engage with each other. Here are these 10 books, but what are they doing? There are people who've written one book in their whole life. And that book continues 
to be relevant and in, in, in to to uh, to have meaning in people's lives right now. Right. So if I can think of an example right now, Steve Biko's book of I write what I like. I think if anyone picked that book up today, um, if you have not read it, I suggest you you read it. Um, but it's it's an example of the the you know the kind of book that carries depth and thought in terms of thinking about a particular idea, a particular issue, a particular phenomenon. Right? So knowledge is a very powerful thing. All right. Uh, so proposal development um, and in particular funding proposal. So these are some of the questions that you ask yourself. And, and, and I think you can also think about this, for example, for your own research as well. What is the problem, right? And if I've identified a problem, why should it be studied? Right. And, and when you've asked that question, then the steps that follow that then you take is selection and, and, and statement of the problem. Right. So if you have an idea, then you, you, you know what the problem is. Um, you've asked yourself that question and it's clear for you, then you can be able to state the problem in your proposal. Right. And the elements of this are the identification of the problem. There's a water issue. Where is the water issue? How is it affecting people? Um, is it about purification? Is it about access? So what exactly is it that I'm seeing as the issue here? What is it that I'm seeing as the problem? And if it's clear to you what then the problem is, then you are able to also justify that problem, right? You're able to prioritize and say, there are all these multiple possibilities but for me, the urgent, pertinent issue to consider around issues of water, water access, water purification, water contamination, what is it that I prioritize? And then am I able to justify this problem? And, I'm, and am I able to justify this priority? Right. So if, if you understand the social imperatives, if you understand if it's if you uh, understand and are clear about what the funder is looking for, then you can be able to link that to so assist you in terms of justification, but also prior, prioritization um, in how you are identifying what the problem that needs attention is. OK. And so what information is already available as it pertains to this problem that I've identified? And this is where the literature comes in. For you to be able to answer the, the, the question of what information is already available, the steps you take is you conduct a literature review. And a literature review means uh, reviewing the relevant sources that are available on that particular issue linked to what you're interested in. So obviously here again, you need to be able to think about what specifically prioritization is the issue. Because if you were to, I'm sure Google and look for data or literature on water purification or water challenges, you're going to find a lot, right? Or on, on water challenges more broadly. So what about water challenges? So what you've done already in terms of identifying a problem and prioritizing and, and defining specifically what your, your statement of the problem is, that's going to assist you in being able to then identify relevant literature that is going to assist you to say this is what's already available as it pertains to this problem that I've identified. OK, so OK, so that's what the problem is. Why are you conducting research on this? What is the likely outcome of this research? What is it that um, 
you you are hoping doing this kind of work is going to assist us to do. And this is where your aim and objectives come. Right. And again here, if you've structured it in this way, then you can see that already that you have a paragraph here, you have a paragraph there, uh, you have a few sentences here, and this is how you're building up your grant proposal. So if you have them clear like this, like if you have a table like this just in your head or you actually have a, a, a table, actual table, then it's going to assist you in the narrative that you're going to write. So when you do the, the project description, this is going to be very helpful for you. All right, so the key elements here of why we have to conduct this research so that we can grapple with this problem and that you're going to then focus on the aims, objectives, um, question, research questions, hypothesis, and specific objectives. Okay, and then when all that those are in place, when you have a hypothesis, when you have um, your aims and goals or your questions, um, as I said, then you can think about the methodology because these are going to guide you and lead you to saying, okay, this is where or how I'm going to do this right, um, for thinking about issues of water. I'm going to get an understanding, spend time in the community, take a sample of the water, test the water, get some experiences in terms of how people are affected um, by the contamination, what's been happening, what's, what's available. So the sources that are there, but then now you're conducting research as well. Are you going to look at the numbers? Are you going to do a mixed method? Um, so each and every step and then engaging with that and explaining and analyzing and understanding that. How are you going to carry out the research? How are you going to collect the data, right? Where is that data going to be coming from? The methods, right? And then here, then you're thinking about the sampling data collection, the type of research, how you're going to interpret. Okay. And who will collect the data and when? And so in, 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 a, in a research, grant proposal uh, and this is where you're going to then say the research assistants will be collecting data for a period of two months or a period of three months right uh, or i together with two research assistants and one of my collaborators we're going to be collecting research and then we're going to be there for two months and doing one two and three so the work plan the work plan how things are going to be done and then the personnel manpower timetable, who's going to be doing it and for how long? You see where this is taking us. This already, if you have this very clear, if you know that you're going to be there for two months, if you know that it's going to be four people there, then already when we get down to the, to the budget, that becomes very clear in terms of you knowing what it is that you need to budget for. But that can only happen if it's clear how the, 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 the plan, the project is going to be carried out, right? How will this be monitored? So if maybe you're sending research assistants to go and do the collecting of the data, will you be going in once a week or once a month, right? To check in, um, to look at what's already been collected. Is there anything that needs to be done differently? Uh, is it Are things on track? So, all of those things are things you need to think about, right? And then the research findings, when the findings are now in place, what's going to happen next? So again, this is the administration now of, of the whole process and the monitoring. And now when you have all this in place, you also then think about how much you're going to need for this to happen. If you're going to be expecting the research assistants to be there, for two months, then you have to be thinking about accommodation, you have to be thinking about their allowance um, and whatever incidentals um, that are needed, but also um, for the extra research costs as well, what research costs are going to be required. And uh, if there's the community involved, in what ways are they going to be involved? Um, and what is it that you're going to be providing? If you're sitting with people the whole day, you're going to be giving them food, um, all of those things you need to think about and this is thinking about those things will lead you to then the budget right so this is 
what I'm going to be needing for me to be able to execute these things. What materials are you going to need? Is there any research equipment that you need to buy? Right. Um, all of that. Um, the, the, the fund collection, the funder is there. So in your case, maybe you're applying for your NISA bursary. So when you're applying for your NISA bursary, it's easier to apply for the internal bursary, bursary at UNISA because um, our forms are still uh, very straightforward um, and, and it's very specific in terms of what you can get funding for. So that one um, is a very simple process in some ways um, because it's already set for you. But I'm hoping that with this you can think about if you were to apply for your own budget or, or your own project rather, um, outside of the UNISA bursary, if you're going to apply for an external scholarship, for example, these are some of the things that would also then be required of you. So what might be different is that maybe you would not be working with research collaborators because this is for your own qualification and for your qualification, we're expecting you to do the work so that at the end you can be able to have ownership of that work that when you get your dissertation or thesis that it will say this is so and so's work right um they can be funding for a research assistant maybe to assist with the collecting of the data sometimes um that may be allowed so for those who are still at the beginning of the research and you're thinking about possibilities of applying for external funding um and depending on the type of work that you're doing, uh, that's something that might be possible. Um, you would need to check, but I know some funders do allow for that. But they, 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 there's a very thin line because at the end of the day, it's still very important that the work is done by you. So even if maybe you get a research assistant to assist you, um, you have to analyze that work. You have to work with the data. So you need to be able to do the bulk of the work as a, as a student so that the thesis that you're going to produce is work that was done by you, right? So knowledge production independently by you. Um, that's 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 the requirement. Okay, and then coming back to the project um, proposal itself, um, who is going to submit when the proposal is done? Um, you're happy with the proposal? Who's going to be submitting it? Um, most Actually, all that I know, um, the, 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 the funders would require the PI, the principal investigator, to then be the one who submits. And how are you going to submit? Is it by email? Is it online submission? Where is the submission going to take place? Right. Um, and then when you've done the work also, when the work is done, when it comes to the reporting, but also the dissemination and all that, how is that also going to happen? All right. So from the preparation, putting together the proposal, this has to be decided upon in the proposal presentation. If maybe there is a requirement for you to actually physically present uh, the, the proposal and uh, the appropriate authority and people that are involved as well. Okay, so it involves you as the researcher and your colleagues and the proposal as well uh, as it is, and then also the ways in which uh, presentation happens, so presentation takes place. Okay, now how do you write a research grant proposal? Um, the proposal is intended to convince others that you have a worthwhile research project and that you have the competence and the work plan to complete it. And that can only be clear if you have a well thought out, uh, well articulated proposal. When you applied to come to UNISA, we expected you to put together an outline um, and that outline assisted in as identifying a relevant supervisor for you. Um, because again, if you apply to the university and you have an idea, you have um, an outline of what you would like to do. If there is no one um, who is available or in that area, the problem that you identify, the topic that you are suggesting, if there's no one who's working in that area, then you might not uh, be able to get uh, accepted uh, because 
there's no one who's going to be able to guide you um, and therefore there's no point, right? Generally, a research proposal should contain all the key elements involved in the research process, um, just like in your, in your own research, right? From identifying the problem to the rationale, to the uh, objectives, to the methodology, to the theory, to the interpretation, everything. So all the different aspects, right? So, and this is across disciplines, across faculties, across different research areas. So regardless of the method that you choose, you need to indicate what it is that you plan to accomplish. What is it that you want to do? Why do you want to do it? And how are you going to do it, right? I always say, yes, you have an idea, you have you've identified a problem, why should we care? So convince me in why this should be given attention, why this should be given support, why this, this you know, why, why should people care about this issue that you, you're bringing about? Right? Should we care because if we don't take care of our water and it's polluted and we waste it, the, then we will uh, run short of water um, soon. And as we know, water is life and without water, there's going to be challenges for us. Um, and as a result of that, we have to give attention to issues of water. OK, so if you say that to me, then you have my attention. I will care because that's important and you've explained to me why it's important. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna fly through this. That a proposal should have a title. We've spoken about that. The abstract, again, we've spoken about that. Um, here's just a reiteration of some of the things for you to think about. Um, what is it that needs to be in the introduction? And here again, this is particular to the research grant application, but as you will see, and that's why I won't spend a lot of time, um, it's very much in line with your general research proposal that you would have put together or that you're busy finalizing right now uh, for your own studies. Okay, so you're providing necessary background. So with the introduction, there's background, there's the context, right, for this problem. So it's not just a floating problem, this problem that exists, this problem that is in this particular context, this problem that stems from this background that leads me to, to, to think about this today. So framing that, that's what the introduction allows you to do. You're inviting me into your journey. You're inviting me into this space, right? So is there something the, the historical issues or historical background um, to this to this issue, right? So if you're looking at um, the issues of HIV and maternal care, you cannot just speak about that without giving a brief background around HIV. Of not not so much that it takes up the whole thing, but but to just show that this issue does not start here but that HIV has over a period of time done this and that and that. This has changed, this has shifted. And today, this issue in particular around HIV and maternal care requires attention because of these particular reasons. There has been other ways in which this has been done, showing this and that and that. So you provide that historical background to say, I understand, I know this. Um, and it's from this that I'm, I'm also entering this conversation. OK, um, so now today in our clinics, in our hospitals, this is what's happening. So now you're bringing me to the present and say as a result of this, these are still the, the gaps. What's missing? What needs to be given attention? Right. Um, key players, we're talking about some people who've done uh, work in in. In, in this in, in this area, you know, there are these people who've given attention to issues around maternal care. There are these people who've given attention to issues around HIV um, and, and women more broadly, for example, or maternity issues. So I'm aware of all the work that exists 
or some of the work that exists. Um, and, and this is how I come into that, that conversation. Right. So your introduction, um, the research problem, the context, right? Uh, the rationale, the major issues that can have the big issue and some sub problems uh, linked to that issue, right? Are there any variables that you're thinking about um, or a phenomenon in particular that you want to study as it relates to this to this issue, right? So what are the variables that are there um, and how will you engage to that? Okay, what is your hypothesis then that you are putting forward, right? What is the theory? What is the assumption? What is the claim that you're making, right? Um, and then indicating clearly that these are the specific, this is the specific thing that you look, this is the specific area, the specific context, um, the boundaries that you're looking within, that you're limiting yourself to, and then the definition. So that's, that's what your introduction is. Okay. All right. And then the conception phase. Formulation of the problem, the literature review, the theoretical construction, and then uh, creating your hypothesis. So that's again in a nutshell. Okay. Formulating your research problem. You've observed, or there's this, there, there, there has been in the recent past this uh, attention to this and that and that. So some of the, so how are you formulating your research problem? How, how did you come to this problem that you're speaking about, right? Um, how or where did this come about for you, right? So there are these apparent gaps. There seems to be silence around this particular issue that does not seem to be uh, attention given to this particular issue. So what is there? Right. Uh, what are the disagreements that are there? Okay. And then you continue working on that until you have a, a, a problem that you're happy with or both you and your um, supervisor are happy with. Is it solvable? What kind of methods are you going to use? Is this problem maybe not feasible or require rethinking? Continue rethinking, you're working on it. Right. And then the literature review, of course, again, to make sure you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, if you don't do literature review, you might find that you're asking a question that's already been asked. OK. Um, you are evaluating critically. That's where you see the gap. That's where you enter the conversation. That's where you sh you show contradictory uh, things that that uh, have appeared also have been written about. This one says this, while this other one says this. While this one says this, they don't seem to have taken uh, or paid attention to this and that. So doing or doing your literature review assists you to be able to do this. Right. Um, Again, this is just more information on the literature. And the steps there. What are the questions? How are you going to search uh, for the data? OK, again, delimiting. Um, there could be, I mean, if you're thinking about work on HIV, for example, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So you need to develop a data search strategy. How are you going to decide how are you going to search for the for, for the literature in your field? What are you going to include? What are you going to exclude? How are you going to determine that? OK, and then working on that to come up with uh, a narrative uh, or, or, or a critique, that critical review that, you, that you're going to be providing. OK, what remains unanswered? What are the gaps based on what already exists? And then, of course, the methods again, the, 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 it's important to provide methodological uh, defense or choices make. Why are you doing a qualitative study? Why are you doing a quantitative study? Like I said, it should not be just because it's comfortable for you. Looking back to your aims and objectives, all these things are linked. Right. So you'll see I'm just flying through this because 
these are some of the things that we did in much of the earlier sessions earlier in the year. Um, but these aspects, these points are also very important when you're writing a grant proposal. That when writing a grant proposal, of course, the, the depth, um, not the depth, the, the, the length um, or, or the extensiveness of what you're going to be doing will be limited, much as when you are writing a, a journal article. Right. Again, it has to be very specific, very focused, very concise um, to the point that the, the reviewers will get what you're saying. They'll see the connections without you having to go on and on and on and on. Right. So when you do when your thesis or your dissertation, you'll be explaining this is why I'm doing qualitative. This is why it's important to do qualitative. Qualitative is about this and that and that. And this is why I'm doing it. So when you're doing grant proposal, you're not going to be explaining to us and defining what qualitative is and quantitative and, and doing all of that. You're going to be talking about what it is that you're going to be doing. So you're not going to be giving us an overview of the many researchers who've defined and explained what qualitative research is. We need that in your qualification in, in, because it's part of your journey and also learning. And we want to also see that you understand um, what you're talking about. So this is very, this is required. Um, and again, you have space, your method section, you have space, you can write pages and pages, which you do not have when you're writing a grant proposal. So that's also just very important. But all these different aspects are very important for your grant proposal as well. OK, so for quantitative studies, those are the things that you would include, as you know. And um, again, when you are writing a proposal, you're asking for money. Obviously, the results are not there yet because you are proposing uh, work that is still going to be done. Right. So planning should focus on the kind of data to be collected and if it's quant, what statistical procedures will be used in order to answer your question or hypothesis. Right. So how are you going to convince your reader, your reviewer of the potential impact of your work? At this point, we don't know yet because you have not done the work, but you're saying this has got potential impact. It's got the potential to actually do this for us to change things that change the views to come up with new ways of doing things in these particular ways right so the merit of this work that i'm proposing is this okay so if you don't contextualize your work obviously that's problematic um if it's not clear what theoretical stand you're coming from uh, it's not clear that's also problematic and then being very focused um, and working and being led by the research question that you've set is very important, right? And then arguments. We had a session on argumentation. You need to develop a coherent and persuasive argument. If you make a claim, if you have an argument, you have to be able to support that argument. You have to um, then go on and, and, and convince me as your reader that this argument that you're making is valid. OK, think about uh, debating if you've ever uh, attended or, or, or taken part in debating. If you if you come, if you stand for a particular idea, you have to justify that idea in a way that then convinces me, the, the listener or the reader, uh, to then go along with what you're suggesting. OK, and then technical oversight, things should be structurally fine um, and, and technical points or issues should be in place, failing which um, obviously your, your proposal or your grant um, application would not be considered and it would fail, if you will. Okay. All right, so this gives, this brings us to the end. Of the presentation. Uh, and now we'll move to questions and comments that you might have. Okay, so I'm gonna check here on my side um, to see if maybe there are any issues that have come up for you. Okay, I might have missed the answer to this question on the previous session. 
Should I have my study proposal prepared before applying for the masters? How do I construct the research outline required on master's application and how many pages it shall be? OK, um, this is a slightly different question, uh, but you don't need to have a full proposal when you apply for master's qualification um, at UNISA. What is required is an outline. So, um, a mini proposal, if you will. So we 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 need this to have an idea of what topic you want to focus on um, and also to have an idea on what methods you're, you're hoping to use for that study. So we just need to get an idea of the, the focus of your work, uh, but to also just get uh, an idea on the, the methodology that you're going to be using and a little bit also on uh, on the literature as well. That is also, that is very important. This is usually about three to five pages. So normally if you go to the UNISA website and you go to the particular department that you're interested in applying to, you'll find that the information is there, right? Um, most departments have actually put together um, a, documents uh, and information. So if you go online and you go to a particular department and then you look at the different courses that are provided and then you go under MND, um, if you click on under the MND, they usually then provide information on how to go about putting together even a proposal. I know of one department that actually has set out very clear um, guidelines uh, on, on how to put together the outline, um, what it must entail and how long it must be. But you're looking at about three to five pages because this is not a proposal yet, but an outline. This outline assists us to be able to check whether there is a supervisor uh, that can be able to supervise that work uh, based on the research focus areas of people and research expertise um, of people as well. So if you're coming up with an idea or a topic that maybe no one has got any expertise on, um, then that might be that might be a challenge. That's not to limit you, it just means maybe a junisa. Uh, you may not necessarily uh, find a supervisor in that field or in that particular department. So sometimes don't limit yourself to a department, maybe look in the discipline more broadly uh, and find out who are the people doing work in a particular field. So you might find that there's someone who's doing work in a particular field, but they may not necessarily be in that department that you are looking at. So if you limit yourself only to that department, you can actually uh, miss out on a potential supervisor because it is possible uh, to have a supervisor who is in a different department. Of course, there are some logistical things that need to be in place uh, in terms of the disciplinary requirements. And then maybe you may have a supervisor and a co-supervisor. Um, maybe the other supervisor can come in and, and guide um, around issues of methodology um, or around issues of theor theory or theoretical perspectives that you're choosing. So that may happen. So yes, I hope I hope that helps. All right. You don't need to have a full on proposal. That is the easy question or, or the straightforward question. And how do you construct the research outline? Um, what I've just done right now, the last part, uh, in terms of speaking about research proposal, that's how you put together a research outline. So think of it as a mini proposal. So let's say in a, if you're putting together a proposal, it's going to be 20 or 30 pages. And that's because maybe your introduction will be two pages, your literature will be seven pages, methodology will be, you know, six or eight pages. In an outline, you will have maybe the introduction is just one page. And then um, you provide a bit of literature and background. That's another maybe page or two. And then you go on to um, explain the methodology, how you're hoping to do this. How will you go about doing it? That's another page or two. So all in all, you're looking at about five pages. Just an outline to give us a glimpse of um, what you're hoping to do and to assist then the department to be able to say yes or no in accepting you as a student. OK, I hope that helps.
Um, and then Moraba, on the aspect of budget, are we allowed to put the contingency line items in case during the project it happens that I encounter challenges that were not identified during my proposal, um, like pandemic or floods? Whew. Um, yes and no, right? <laughs> uh, you you cannot you cannot um, put contingency uh, line item like floods, for example. So because you, I'm saying that because you use that as an example. So but what often um, is is then um, allowed, you know, when there are specific line items um, where you would say staff, equipment, conference, very specific things. Uh, some some funders uh, allow space for miscellaneous, right? So some of the things that may be needed along the way that maybe in this moment uh, you might not be aware of or clear or, or clear on that may come up, right? So um, you can call those miscellaneous. Um, and then as a result, um, you can put on uh, some money. And of course, um, if, if it's a long-term project, uh, three years or five years. We know that uh, each and every year we, we're dealing with inflation rates and you, you've budgeted that maybe in the second year you're going to buy this particular equipment and when you were doing your budget you checked with the supplier and asked how much is this equipment and they're saying no it's 50,000 rand but remember it's 50,000 rand now in September 2020 and you're only going to maybe purchase it in 20 in 2022 i mean you're only going to purchase it in 2023 next year so chances are it would have gone up the price would have gone up so when you put together your budget there's also um, an allowance with some funders where you can um, add 10 percent so uh, there's a million and then you add 10 percent um, and then that that also can be can be catered for because even when you're going to get student um, assistance for your work, you are going to be giving them a salary. And again, with the salary, um, there are some increments uh, each year. And often with with um, salaries that gets calculated by whatever institutions that you attach to. So the institution will then tell you this is how much people get paid if they are student assistants. So you put that for 2022 and then for 2023, let's say you've, you've um, put 200 um, and then you add 10% of the same amount for 2023, you add again another 10% for 2024. So in that way, when increments happened, happen, then you know that you're covered. OK, and then when things, for example, that are out of your control, like pandemics happen. Um, I know with some of the projects that some of us were busy with, um, I mean, the funders are also affected by that, right? Um, and if they had said, no, the project must be done in 2024 because you started in 2022, they, they will um, not penalize you for not using the money. They will not penalize you because your study was affected by the pandemic. Um, so that will then be also taken into consideration um, because unfortunately you, you cannot plan for natural disasters and say I'm going to add on some money in case there's a natural disaster. Right, uh, things that you cannot plan for like that, unfortunately you cannot put in your budget, but you can put miscellaneous, you can uh, add in terms of percentages to account for possible increments. Um, and also if maybe there is something that happens like floods in the area where you are going to do your research and you could not do that research at that particular time, or there were some funds lost, you were already there and that happened. So which means money was already spent but at the end of the day, you didn't get to do what you had intended to do due to the floods, but money was spent because things were paid for. Um, those are things that will also then form part of your report um, to the funder. 
and then you 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 can check um, whether there, there would be a, a willingness maybe to assist with additional funding um, and that will be at, at their discretion. But at the same time, as part of the report, then you also know that you cannot and you will not be penalized for something that was uh, beyond your control that negatively affected your research. OK, so these are some of the things um, that when you are applying for grants uh, would be taken into consideration. So I hope I hope that helps. OK. OK, Anonymous, you are welcome. I'm glad your question was answered. OK. All right, uh, let me see. I don't see any more questions. OK, so if there are no more questions, we still have 15 minutes, uh, but we don't have to wait until uh, the, 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 the whole two hours is gone. If there are no more questions, I'm trying to think of any additional things that I would like to share right now. There aren't any, um, but once again, we will be having another session on Friday, our third and last session for the grant writing proposal uh, series. So um, I invite you again to to come through on Friday as we are going to be doing the last session. I'm going to try and see if maybe we can do some um, or provide some practical um, example of a grant and the practical steps that one uh, follows for that uh, with the hope that that would be helpful. Um, and I also realize that for some of you, um, you may be thinking about bursaries or scholarships, uh, but with these grants, even though I think with the presentations, I've been talking more about bigger grants, but I want you to, to think about them also even for smaller grants. So, for example, for your own research as well, especially those of you who are doing your PhDs, because this is also going to go a long way beyond your PhD um, in saying that you managed to successfully uh, get a grant while you were doing your PhD. Uh, because unfortunately, especially if you are interested in staying on in academia, in being an academic or in being a researcher, even if you're working for a research institute, um, the importance of applying for grants um, is very central uh, in these fields. So if you have at least some skills, the know-how, um, understanding of the approaches and steps of one, what one needs to do and how one needs to go about applying for a grant, um, it will be helpful for you. So while maybe for some of you it might not be immediately clear in terms of the relevance, considering that maybe you're just still busy with your own studies. Um, there are external grants that are available for masters and doctoral uh, students. For example, the, the, the NRF, there are grants that are available there. And for most um, of those, you need to be able to, to understand some of these processes. And this understanding and understanding um, and being aware of what the reviewers are often looking for will assist you and increase your chances of actually being successful when you are applying for the grant. And having been successful in applying for a grant increases um, your chances again. Um, it already puts you ahead um, when you do then officially uh, join the academic ranks. Um, it's, it's, it's very important because I know in many institutions, um, having successfully applied for a grant, having attained a grant goes a long way even for, for promotions, uh, but also even for getting a job. If you can prove and show that you have the potential to secure a grant because funding is important for institutions, that already uh, puts you at an advantage. All right, so um, with that, I think we can call it a day or call it a night. Um, I will hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening, the rest of your afternoon, wherever you are. And I look forward um, to being with you again on Friday when we are busy with our last session on grant writing. OK, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>